frostbite disease, mal- malnutrition. A few poultry trades with the local Probably Inuit have barely kept the men alive until June, when the thaw allowed them to escape, but not to England. Hudson doggedly pursued the Northwest Passage, and in an attempt to quell rebellion again, distributed the remaining stores of food and rations to build rapport with the men, but it had the opposite effect. The crew mutinied, and they bound Hudson, his young son, and six loyal men onto a ship, a rowboat, barely big enough to hold them all, before setting them adrift onto the waters. That's the screwed up, man. That bears his name today. Is the audio good? As the Discovery good, sailed good enough. back to London, Oops, they watched as I the rowboat, the tags, their former the master, grew smaller and smaller until it disappeared entirely. <coughs> Hudson and the rest were never heard from again. Future attempts were met with similar fates. Ships would sail into Hudson's Bay in the summer months and search every cranny of the inlet for a passage to the west. In the winter, they would build tamarack houses and bunker down with supplies. And if they were fortunate, the tags. open relations with the local Indians to trade for the necessities. In 1631, the voyage of Captain James and Captain Fox conclusively ended the dream of a Northwest passage through the bay. And for a hundred years thereafter, no serious attempt was made. Global warming. The Captain West James and his memoirs did make one significant note. That near the mouths of the rivers flowing to this bay was the home of many of the choicest fur-bearing animals in the world. Wonderful. But he wasn't the only one to make this observation. See, in 1666, 35 years later, two French explorers would gamble their fortunes and their lives on the creation of the largest trade empire to exist in the New World. Pierre Asprit Radisson and Medard Roslier was were already legendary figures before they turned. Wait. Traveling through many outposts and villages. Okay, how's he took my note volume of how the local versus people the video. survived and even thrived? And in 1654, convinced many of the Indian converts to conduct a trade mission with him Watch to the him. French settlements. Gosh. Bringing with them pelts and tales of far reaching lands and strange metals in the rock, he caught the attention of many of the French officials and local frontiers. <laughs> One such man was Radisson who had an altogether different experience with the natives. When he was 15 years old on a duck hunt, he was kidnapped by a band of Mohawks and was quickly adopted into their tribe after undergoing ritual torture in order to initiate him right to actually, family, did you get the family, representing a about? sort of rebirth into the Mohawk Can world. you like it, please? I think you already did. but He was there for a long time, growing into an adult, and he made one attempt to escape in this time of captivity. When he and an Algonquin warrior was captured by Algonquin, New England. That's us. Managed to convince him to slay his Mohawk companions. Wow. Try and make it to a French outpost. They did so, hacking down his former brethren. Damn, bro. Made a run for it, hoping to make it to Trois Riviers or Montreal. But they were caught. And Radisson was giving a lesson. He oh, never um, I got one. I, I need to know what other stuff I need. I'm going to watch a few more videos, but I kind of wanted to wait for you. So that's why I wanted to do it tomorrow. And eaten by the Mohawk Braves. Radisson somehow managed to convince the others that he was merely the captain of the Algonquin men, not involved in the murders at all. But this only bought him his life. Well, he was then thrown in with a group of captives of Huron French settlers. He was tied to a pole in the center Huron. of the village. How are Fires Huron getting all the way over there? The Haudenosaunee are between ceremony them. began. First, they pulled out his fingernails. Yeah, this is a thing. One by one. I'm sorry for this. As he sang their songs to prove his tolerance to pain. Right. That was what they were they supposed to do. They would make fun of the Europeans. branded him across the body. And he was slashed up and down. Right to the bone. His family drew close and told him that he, if he could withstand the pain, he could live amongst them again. This could be a ceremonial Finally, death. They drove a spike through his foot. Well, that'll do it. Radisson had survived, but at a great cost. 
two years passed before he made another attempt, knowing that there would be no third ritual to save him. Luckily, this one was successful. Hi, and he arrived at a Dutch outpost on the Hudson Bay. So these Germany rituals were... Um, Rosier and Radisson... Sometimes they would be tortured to death. Sometimes they would be... Sister. And together they spoke at length of the peoples of this land and the riches... I don't want to speak over this. Both were impressive linguists. But they would they join if they passed the, the test. They could join and take the... This is what morning wars are. Morning north, wars are about. connected many peoples along the coastline. Talking together, they devised a plan to make contact with the nations of these groups and open trade relations. However, the current governor of New France turned them down at the time, rather impetuously, and rejected their proposal outright. In fact, he fined them for conducting trade without a license. But word spread of their daring enterprise, and an English merchant saw the potential, and he convinced them to seek an audience with the king back in England. They set sail and arrived in London at the edge of apocalypse. The year was 1665, and already a sixth of the English population was dead of the bubonic plague that had been running rampant across Europe. The Great Fire of London next would also delay their audience with the king and halt any funds that could, they could have counted on. Nevertheless, they sailed up the Thames and brought to Oxford, where they were kept on salary for real years terms. to tell their in stories England. and garner support for their mission. Wow. In their fur coats and moccasins, they were a eccentric sight awesome. amongst the nobility. It was a precipitous time to arrive. The English Civil War had recently ended, and the repressive Puritan rule of Oliver Cromwell was replaced with the rambunctious overtures of King Charles II. Creative Based. expression of all sorts under Cromwell had been discouraged, if not outlawed. From theaters to festivals to any arts-related endeavors. But upon ascension, Charles II wanted to reverse this trend while reforming his court towards the natural sciences. So the king financed the arts. Festivals, religious celebrations, parties, architecture, the sciences, establishing the Royal Society of London for improving natural knowledge, or the Royal Academy of Science, as it was later known. Yeah. This, his many, many children and mistresses, Research as well as the time. rebuilding of the British Navy, oh, this was a long brought time exorbitant ago. costs that needed huge sums to be covered. And with the king's coffers running dry, Charles was in need of a highly profitable charter to sustain its restoration, Duh, brother. especially one that would prevent France from gaining a foothold in the New World. And the answer was currently sitting in the lounges of Oxford. The king was encouraged by his cousin, Prince Rupert, to hear their tales of beaver pelts and copper ore. Prince Rupert was a badass. By a massive and mostly uninhabited region called Hudson's Bay. I think he did naval. Name. He's not well known, but he's... The idea of controlling a new and profitable cool. trade route inspired confidence, especially as Radisson regaled the court with his tales of captivity and the wilderness he grew up in, saying, we were Caesars, being nobody to contradict us. A new world. So, an expedition in 1668 was was uh, coordinated. However, it was nearly thwarted when the ship holding Radisson had to turn back after being swamped by a storm off the coast of Greenland. But Grossier's ship, the Nonsuch, sailed on and arrived on the shores of Hudson's Bay, where they set up camp for the winter. This time, as the natives arrived oh, no, to trade, no, 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 they were surprised no, no, to find no, no, a well-equipped no. force, eager for their fur pelts. 300 Bay Indians, mostly Cree, arrived in the spring, and a league of friendship was agreed to. In exchange for beaver pelts, they received knives, hatchets, cutlery, trinkets, and muskets. And after a summer of successful trade, oh, they returned to England with a shipload of furs fit for a king. Awesome. At the behest of Prince Rupert, the king granted them a royal charter, forming the Company of Adventurers. This was okay the before it became too many. The trade and commerce of Hudson's Bay as true and absolute lords and proprietors of the region that included all the seas, straits, bays, rivers, lakes, creeks, and sounds within the entrance of the Hudson's Bay, and with all the lands, countries, and territories on the coasts and confines of the seas aforesaid. Mm. Nobody the really had the authority to do that, 7, unfortunately. 7,000 words long written on five sheepskin parchments, that carried the king's signature. 
it encompassed 1.5 million square miles of territory oh, from the sorry. Rocky Mountains to the St. Lawrence River. It contained 40% of what would one day become Canada and most of Minnesota and North Dakota. Because most of this land was undiscovered, it not only assigned the right of control over an unimaginable amount of land, Literally. but also the sole trading rights over what could have included the Northwest Passage. The potential wealth in this document mirrors perhaps no other in history. But first, they'd have to defend it. And there, I want to open it up and see if... Uh, Discussion. Vinny, if any thoughts, questions, or interest that we can go over before we move on i don't know you just broke me out of my spell i was like totally enthralled with what you were talking about I was like larping the value idea that there on could be Twitter. so much wealth Link just locked up in, in that land and like how huge it was yeah i don't know i don't, I don't, th I don't think i have anything to add I, I just want to keep listening to you talk about this <laughs> uh i appreciate it um, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, Twitter space. Maybe it was I should incredible be in there. what they were away, but really good. Time, narrative is there great. was other, um, uh, other examples where huge monopolies were being given out. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of East and West Indian trading companies. So that's what we know as like the Caribbean all the way out to, uh, Asia, these different, uh, charters. Were Hello to anyone joining. This is a Twitter land, space we're listening to. Link is in the description. Um, it's live right now. The scope yeah. of this was, was but appreciate if you'd like as the, became the thing as well. I think it's important to like realize that like when in 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 sixteen hundreds Europe, you couldn't just start a company, right? Any of us can go to like the county this recorder's office and yeah. go like get an LLC formed, right? That's like a you know you know human right that we all have in like democracies. But back then, you had to have like a royal charter in yep. order to like charter. do business places right and so the all of companies, these companies these early like the East India trading company the dutch trading company right the they they had they were you had some really wealthy well-connected men in london who were jockeying over right these royal charters and that's that's how you start a company so i think like back during this time period there were, there were uh, only patronage like seven patronage. english Bog -Beef companies Marble. Shout out, patronage. total you know so it wasn't just something anybody could go do yeah, they were very few. And it, you're right. It wasn't just that they were rare. Um, I mean, as I said, Charles II was looking for opportunities like this. Um, and it wasn't like there, yeah. it, it wasn't that there was no options, but it took time. Like, you're right. You can go over to, uh, you know, you can form a company or an LLC in an afternoon nowadays. Um, but very uh, Radisson and Grossier Big were reason why for, it's, I think, a year or two. Well, I mean, not everywhere is like before that. they had an audience with the, the Western thing. You it's know, a very it wasn't American like thing. We'll schedule you a month from now. It was, you know, hang around for a year. And if we I like say your North American spunk, thing. then, uh, you know, we'll let you in and you can have a chat with them. Um, yeah. And then you better hope that what you bring forward is, you know, worthy of his attention. In fact, a lot of uh, the reason. Uh, that they uh, they still wore their fur coats and their moccasins all throughout those uh, that year year and a half was because they wanted to make that impression. You know, if you just wore the styles of the day, you were going to blend in with the rest of them. I mean, sure, you yeah. wanted to put off a, a long uh, way, you know, an air of um, nobility that you you know fit in with the king and uh, whatever his interests were at the time. But they turned heads when they uh, when walked in, in wearing, you know, beaver and bear pelts that, you know, right, these white guys are Indians. Time. Beaver white guys. Mar yeah, go it's ahead. Marketing and fundraising. Yeah. It's optics, yeah, public bro. relations. Yeah, exactly. At the PR stunt. I think the other two, optics the other big important. thing to remember here is that, like, um, the financing of these operations was really new as well right we we're all used to the idea of like hey you can go raise money and like take ownership in a company or whatever we we all know how the the vc model works nowadays but back then like the more now the dutch well. were the ones who really pioneered this they were the ones who figured out how to like divvy up like stock options, options yeah. and then actually create Why markets small country you know, secondary so markets or trading markets for those like ownership stocks that they started introducing the english learned about how to finance these things from the Dutch across the channel. So the, the Dutch were a little bit ahead when it came to the, the organization and the finance, kind of why the Dutch, the Dutch East India Company got got bigger a little bit earlier. And that's still in New York uh, the, City. The, the that culture is still a lot there. Of these tricks from, from them at the same time. 
Yeah, that's that, that's very true. I, in fact, I remember your. Uh, I think you did a thread or two about this um, a few weeks to uh, a few months ago. Uh, it was great. Yeah, and I mean that's that's where the name Dutch Dutch India Trading Company comes from. Uh, just like the Royal African Company um, from the British was there. Try to make it would it be in the name, and you know the impressive name, the company of yes, adventurers. See who's talking was there here. for a reason as well. The king yeah. had to inspire confidence to his backers because it wasn't just oh, his go. money uh, that he was putting into it, uh, which I believe is a little different from the Dutch. You know, the king would put in some money and say, like, yeah. uh, you know, I, here's my trust that this will go well. And of course, you know, I get my cut of it. But it was also to inspire confidence for all the people in his court, uh, yeah. especially the many investors that he needed um, and to need to show that he was of sound mind and making good decisions to repay his debts uh, for running the country. So yeah. um, I can just leave it back so there. Like, okay, learning how to stream, guys. Anchor. Sorry. Yeah, I was gonna say it's like when you have like an anchor VC go run, the, go like found the they they they're the first one on like the Series A for a tech company. The King was the the first one in the in the same way. Exactly. Yeah, and so uh, it was, it, and this was the uh, the start of it all. So. Um, but as you mentioned before, like there was a lot of potential in, in what they could get because these were risky endeavors, you know, like yeah. as much as uh, I, and this makes sense. You're not going to make a lot of money, uh, you know, with a charter to sell, um, you know, what would it be like shirts or shoes, you know, yeah. from England to France, because there's already so many people that were doing it and it would be impossible to stop. That's why they were looking, in fact, for things that they could monopolize. Um, if you only had a handful of ships that ever made it to Hudson's Bay, then you could pretty well control who was going in and out of there. Damn. Um, yeah. Not just the British and your competitors, but your competitors somebody. and your sometimes enemies, the French, the Spanish, the, the Dutch, whoever else. So at this time, it was about exerting control over this uh, area, just as it much was uh, profit. Um, yeah. And, and, they kept it very light. So when the Hudson's Bay Company officially set up uh, and Radisson and Grossier and the uh, the other factors who set up uh, outposts right along the Hudson's Bay Company, um, they, know what I they began very simply. They went into the bay, which had several maps existing of it now. Uh, they went straight to the largest rivers that fed into it. And there they would build shelters uh, in the form of forts. So you would have uh, very simple dwellings, you know, a place for everyone to live. You might have a smithy set up, a carpenter room, a warehouse, um, may, a light armory, which would probably be in the main shelter as well. Uh, oftentimes they'd plant a small garden or have a barn where they would keep um, some livestock. Most of what uh, kept them busy in the Hudson, like uh, for most of the year, was just pure survival. Trade was almost incidental, but trade was good. So they would set up these forts and posts um, near the mouths of the rivers, and they put the word out. Uh, now, the group that lived primarily around Hudson's Bay and took control of it in the ensuing decades and centuries was the Cree. So the Cree would broker sales uh, between the Hudson's Bay Company themselves and also the, the different nations and tribes around them. So they caught on to this very quickly. They found that if they traded all of their beaver pelts, they would get, uh, you know, these muskets, they would get silverware, they would get manufactured goods that England had a huge industry for already. They spent most of, most of England's economy was spent on building things. They didn't have vast tracts of land to grow food, so they needed to import a lot of their necessities. So they started building uh, mills and workhouses and sweatshops and factories where, um, you know, clothes, cutlery, trinkets, weapons, anything that you are there can four people here and no one's saying uh, anything. That's fine. In a, a secondary economy. And so yeah. they realized that the value that they were putting into creating these could be multiplied Hello. by the raw materials that they could trade with the Cree for. And so the Cree were astonished. You know, they would trade their pelts and get these, you know, alien-looking they discovered uh, usury back, or not, uh, not or even, valuable but... looking trinkets. Um, and all it would cost them were beaver pelts, which were plentiful around them. But while there were, oh. you know, millions of beavers at the time that the Hudson's Bay Company arrived, they they would quickly be beavered out, as it was called. 
um, you know, they, this is a Twitter space. Beavers do multiply quickly. Links below. They have Thank a you. Larger than usual. Course Overlord, I really appreciate that, man. They're actually the largest rodent in Lot. North America. Love that. Um, and they require it to have, uh, you know, a section of a creek, a lake. Um, if many of you have been, you know, camping uh, or, you know, into the backcountry, you may have seen, you know, your fair share of beaver lodges and beaver dams, but they're typically only, you know, one or two on a lake, maybe three. Um, and the beaver dams themselves uh, are spread out as well. Notorious because they change the direction of the water. Uh, they, the water can only be held back so many times before it uh, is dissipated. So once the Cree have killed off all of their beavers or the vast majority of them, they still wanted to trade. And so they were smart. They uh -oh. went to the groups outside of their territory Ooh, and said, hey, they became we the want middle your man, beaver huh? pelts and we'll give you, uh, you know, one musket and then go ahead and trade those pelts for two or three muskets themselves and became Arbitrage. a sort of broker in between them. And this so was available because the economy. Cree had become trusted by the Europeans. Well. The Cree were not significant. So the Cree were a there cultural. There were a lot of wars and uh, uh, go between. Tell, some Very important. Diplomacy going on between world the history. Groups. The they major put themselves players in a good were position. the uh, Iroquois or the Haudenosaunee, uh, the Mohawk, and the Cree. The Mohawk the are a Haudenosaunee um, tribe. And the Anishinaabe groups. But uh, should let him know really, that. We, we def refer to them now as single entities, but they were typically small groups that may have shared the same language or customs, which eventually became a, we'll call it a political group in the 20th century, uh, after a lot of their uh, land and population was um, dissipated. But at the time, the Cree were a middle power. Love that, they man. They realized that with the here on the, and the, the other side, and even just the commerce um, power that they got from trading directly. With like I'm from the they coast could, of New England, they, they so we got a lot of similar land. stuff. And that they did. They quickly dominated their neighbors. Uh, they were notable for taking a lot of slaves, uh, especially of the Algonquin, um, which was fine as long as the West Native Americans are very cool. Hudson's Bay a lot of specific stuff about them. Keep in mind, these outposts were never staffed to the brim you may have had a dozen or less people at each fort, uh, at each mouth of the river. The more people you employed there, the more you had to pay them. And more importantly, the more you had to I go up to Washington them, quite a bit warm during the winter. The way this, uh, they were typically set up would uh, you leave in the late spring or early summer when the ice flows would break up in Hudson Strait. Um, moving through without worrying about the ice or icebergs, you would arrive in early to midsummer uh, at the Hudson's Bay, depending on how far into the bay you were going, uh, and you would set up and prepare all ready to trade and prepare for the winter. Mm. You weren't going to trade too much in the summer I wonder how because many of these guys the died. pelts that you were going to be getting were a bit thinner um, if you were if they were being hunted freshly from the uh, the creek. So. The first few months were spent uh, preparing, and then you might get a relief or a supply vessel come in in the fall before the winter hit, uh, as long as it could make it back to England before they were trapped by the ice uh, in the in James Bay or Rupert's Bay um, at the top of the Hudson's Bay. So yeah. if you've resupplied, now you're bunkering down for the winter. There's only about 12 of you. Now Jeez, you start man, 12 guys. Coming in, you're in the uh, middle of nowhere. Around you, and you had to be firm with them. You had to let them know this is what uh, you would trade with you couldn't let them go for anything less because the company would fire you you wouldn't get paid and you know the time spent in this hellhole oh. would be for nothing you might or you know worse you'd be and they're allowed to make that be on you, you had dude. to keep diplomatic Thank God for work protection jobs because again you were surrounded by thousands but then you're incentivized of, of different people with different to have customs, those good different relations ideas about what was just and what was fair so they Typically, the most successful Hudson's Bay Company employees were ones that spoke the language, learned the customs, and were able to open fair and, um, uh, how to say, amenable relations Lewis with the Cree. Uh, otherwise, you'd have you know a war band surrounding your fort, and with six people who signed on from you know Wales or Scotland or Ireland because they wanted to make a few pounds a year instead of a few shillings back home yes. they weren't going to die for the hudson's bay company i hope uh, not or at least right? not against uh, a band of natives but let's talk a bit about the the pelts that they're wearing uh because at first most of the trade was for freshly hunted beavers um 
but this quickly fell out of fashion. And the reason was these beaver pelts were not worn at their imminent stage or fresh stage where you had uh, a thick bushing of fur over it. You wanted to felt it down. Hmm. So what the traders realized after a few years was instead of bringing these beaver pelts, trading them, buying them from the Cree, shipping them back to England, what would happen next is they'd have to send it back on to Russia because Russia had a monopoly over the felting process. Beaver pelts were waterproof, yes, and comfortable mostly. By turning them into felt, they became a lot lighter. They became more waterproof and durable, and most importantly, a bit more fashion sensible. Instead of wearing literally the skin of a uh, a freshly killed beaver, it would look something closer to cloth um, and a, a thinner but durable material. As I mentioned, the Russians had a monopoly on the felt making process. They kept much of it secret. A lot of commerce and a lot of uh, the the economic practices around this time in Europe was around secret practices. I mentioned before that uh, the Portuguese and the Spanish had uh, maps of the trade winds that they kept secret for um, over a hundred years um, before they were discovered and captured by the British. It's the same in this case. So. At this time, you would bring the beaver pelts to England and then send them on to Russia to be treated, turned into felt, and then sent back to be made into clothing. This cost a lot of money and a lot of time, and it dug into the profits that the Hudson's Bay Company was making. They would later figure out how to treat it themselves, but before that, there was a more organic solution. They found that a lot of the coats that the Cree were wearing contained felt which was strange because they didn't have access to the materials or have any idea of the process of felting. And so they asked him about it and they found out that what these the dudes knew how to do it. They didn't even the know pelts, turn them inside out and make their jackets and pants this way. So that the fur was on the inside uh, of their, they their didn't coats. think to put the fur on the inside. It wasn't as waterproof, but no. it kept them much warmer uh, and provided a Once bit more layer. tighter insulation when they were going out in the winter. Or on the outside, it had a double on the inside, effect. Too much. See, there's two too layers of fur on a beaver. There is an outer layer of coarser hair, which is waterproof, yes, but not as comfortable and tends to fall out eventually. And then there's the inner fur, which is a bit softer and uh, gets crushed when it turn, is turned inside out. So if you take a beaver nice. felt, make a jacket, and wear it for you know, two seasons, maybe a year, all the coarse hairs start to fall out and the inner hair gets padded down and down and down and crushed and and turned slowly into felt. And so they, this was actually hilarious to the Cree because the Hudson's Bay uh, men, once they realized this, they're like, oh, we don't want your fresh pelts. We want the jacket that you're wearing. And they're like, you want this old jacket for a musket? Yeah, sure. And they would often report to the Jesuits and other missionaries in the area uh, that they felt they were sometimes taking advantage of these European traders because they were getting all these wonderful, valuable items and manufactured goods for their handmade. That's perfect. They literally just later on the British. They they process them through using them in the only way. um, A lot of time, a lot of, um, you know, manual labor, but also mercury to treat the fur to sort of. uh, make the the felting process go quickly but famously the fumes of the mercury causes delirium and deve- the, the the hatters developed uh erythism or mercury poisoning mm-hmm. this is known as mad hatter's disease and it's popularized in the, the story alice in wonderland you can see the mad hatter wearing a hat of beaver pelt that clearly had been treated with too much mercury driving him a little wonky Is that better? I don't know what to put it on. What also happened was uh, around this time was the hatting industry in England took off and it kind of was very, uh, very lucky and opportunistic for the Hudson's Bay Company because there was a market for these pelts and furs beforehand. Uh, But at the time in the late 17th century in France, uh, a huge divide and religious conflict between Catholics and Protestants had many of these expert Protestant haberdashers or hat makers to flee a haberdasher to, was like a over, the, uh, over the sea to England. And so they set up shop there. They began to take these uh, felts or these, uh, these furs, these pelts and these, these felt materials and turn them into expertly handcrafted hats. 
and so the oh. hat fashion industry dramatically rose. Uh, oh yeah, hats became a status. fancy hats. The royalty wore them. The uh, high members of the uh, fancy Church hats of wore them. What was a big part uh, of the freaking... uh wore them as well. Uh, they were sometimes worth their weight in gold. The in fact, many the people Native Americans. Owned two. They're really Wonderful. nice hat for special occasions, and a extra not as nice hat for when it was raining or sleet out. So there's a lot That's going on. For, I like my uh, hats for these beaver pelts. It wasn't just a simple issue of uh, grab them, throw them on the ship, and send fit. them back. Um, anyway, Here, let me, uh, what do you yeah, think of that? I think, it is. <laughs> I, I think back then the um... yeah, that's um, I, I didn't know any of that actually. That's uh, also I think that back then it was all most think, of Europe, um, especially one England, other thing was, I was based thinking on about too, while you're talking France. is how they would. Um, take the the scent glands from the beaver and then use that as bait are you gonna talk about that yeah absolutely um it's kind yeah. of that's that's really funny as well um what do you do you know much about it yourself no i know i just i just remember like every time i'm reading about the in these trappers journals out here like in the american west they were they were they're always talking about how they'd like cut out the scent glands and like put it in a pouch and they'd use it like to to bait their traps like later on and i just i didn't know much about it other than that yeah so um it's there's a lot of funny aspects to it uh it's also maybe not so funny for the beavers so there when they started hunting um beavers you know it was all well and good to just trade with the cree uh in fact the hudson's bay company that's how it starts that their men stay within the forts and then they get Again, more comfortable you if you lose you know a couple men to disease frostbite whatever you don't need to also worry that they're going to be gallivanting off down these rivers and lakes yeah it really is JC. killed some some way because there is death everywhere at this point um however once the Cree started uh not being able to deliver as many pelts as they had before uh the hudson's bay company re uh, relaxed some of their rules and allowed uh hunters to go forth themselves mm -hmm. um so the reason I bring this up is because uh, there's a lot of stories and firsthand experiences of people hunting beavers, and a lot of it kind of got twisted into uh, myth and legend as well. But uh, a lot of early reports had them uh, saying that beavers lived in these big houses that they made that had several layers, um, condominiums or apartment complexes, if you will, uh, little villages and uh, societies that they would live in. One. Uh, Hudson's Bay employee laughed when he got back to England and heard these stories. He said, they've ascribed everything to the beaver except, uh, what was it, um, a religion and a code of laws. Uh, oh. basically, basically saying, like, you know, they've, they've uh, stretched the truth. In reality, yeah. we do know that beavers build dams where they live in lodges, which do sometimes contain multiple levels uh, so that they can go under the water links are in uh, the comments without having to links are in the, the description top, rather from predators and yeah. also go under the ice in the winter so this was found out by early hunters and what they would do is travel uh in groups and one would you know startle them or break open the top of the lodge um, and watch them escape you know into the water or in, under the ice and so another would wait for them to do that track them follow them uh, and either break open the ice where there's an air pocket where they would be hiding uh, or follow them on the shoreline until they got close enough to be, um, you know, shot, uh, bow and arrowed, or speared. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, but your question was about the, uh, the scent glands. So there was one story. There, there was a popular glands, story that it. when you're hunting a beaver, it would often be two men following it, and as it's running away, it would bite off its testicles and leave them behind. <laughs> yeah, with its huge buck teeth, and then it would run away. And so the second oh, what's the point of living to uh, to catch You're up? Going to back it, where, and there's drawings of this where it would stand up and show. Look, I've castrated myself. <laughs> you got nothing here, like except my pelt. Yeah. Can you just let me go? And it's the hunter would be like, Yeah, okay, you can get out of here. Damn, dude. Yeah. Like it's so not that's what they wanted. <laughs> yeah. Well, the glands were very valuable. Um, yeah. It's they weren't actually their testicles, but they were like uh, near the pelvis. That's good. So it would be easy for someone not you know familiar with beaver anatomy to you know make the distinction. But the scent glands, you know, provide a uh, they keep the hormones in check for the beaver. Uh, they allow it to um, uh, attract mates, uh, declare its territory using scent, but. Um, for us, we have a few other uses for it. Um, the two most popular at 
that time uh, were using it for medications and perfume, uh, but also for flavoring. Because for some reason, these scent glands from the beaver are oh, very yeah. similar to, I think it's vanilla and strawberry. That's really strange. I've never heard that. Yeah. And I think it was used uh, even as late as the 20th century in like beaver farms. They would like harvest the glands and like, why waste? So, yeah. mm. but in fact, the, uh, the it's kind of interesting that the reason I wanted to tell that uh that story about the beaver was uh, because of its Latin name. It's Castor uh, Canadensis. Castor. Dentis, coming from yeah, the word it's have something to do with the teeth, right? Uh, because of this, you know, trick where you would take its testicles or it would relinquish its testicles on its own. Is that related to the, the word castor oil? You know, I, I was looking that up the other day and I couldn't find, uh, I don't think I found something. Um, verifiable about that but it could be i i thought of that as well but uh at the very least it does come from the latin uh, to uh to, to remove the balls interesting yeah so there was a whole industry that uh, developed cooler and it became very lucrative at first uh prince rupert stayed on as governor um he was a very intelligent man of the court he was a veteran of the 30 years war with france um i think he was a privateer during the english civil war attacking the cromwellians uh, but he was also a very learned man. He, you know, studied the natural sciences, mathematics, uh, astronomy, physics. So, you know, not only this was probably why he saw such a, um, a he saw the potential in the uh, the enterprise when Radisson and Grossier first brought it up. Prince Rupert, so man, he was the first. Hey, there's not a lot written about him. Making sure that they he kept was their awesome. duties. Oh, I'm just seeing one of those uh, times. my good friend Marlon. Uh, he's in the space, Marlon. I'm gonna bring you up here um because he's got a lot to talk about as well but uh prince rupert was a great governor for the hudson's bay company when he uh first came on and they were pulling record profits right away um they managed to uh i think it was hit 200 percent return on investments in the first few years that he was on there uh but unfortunately uh prince rupert had i believe he stepped down before he died um but uh, the next person they brought in, the Duke of York, was abysmal. He kind of tanked the, uh, the Hudson's Bay Company for a few years, uh, wasn't investing in infrastructure, wasn't allowing things to expand, uh, relations with the Cree devolved, um, and they realized that they needed someone else. Uh, luckily, the Duke of York later became King of England, and so he had to relinquish the title uh, of governor. Uh, he was a very forgettable king, as he was a governor, uh, and the next man, I believe, was uh, may have been Jason Knight or James Knight. Uh, I'll pull that up in a sec. It's a Twitter space for you. Uh, the two hundred percent return on an, in the, inv the investment. Are we speaking? And I apologize for being so late. Um, I had to had some familial business to take care of. Uh, All good. Uh, the 200 percent return on investment was that on the fur trapping trade or what was this what was this just uh, just to catch me up to speed yeah 100 percent. yeah exactly so this was the hudson's bay company uh prince rupert was the first governor um and it was 200 percent. No. it was primarily yeah. um beaver pelts that they were after because it was the they were the easiest to hunt provided the best furs so this um, is twitter space they weren't above taking you know like foxes Prove or it. hares or other fur bearing animals but they would rather trade for the beavers because they got the most bang for their buck back home um so so that's what uh, got them such a high return at first uh, what, I would, what i would recommend everybody uh take a look at is uh steven ranella does a good series uh called meat eater um, and he, he, do, he does a lot of uh, cooking uh, wild game uh, recipes. He does he, he, he shows um, what it's like to actually be a true hunter. November. A lot of his episodes. He's going to be going on a bear hunt he, he for the guy. Got that all set up. Get anything. Uh, but he does a good thing on beavers. Uh, there, there's an episode where he does on beavers and how beavers were really the first. And I'm sure you, you've already covered this. The beaver was the kind of gold standard of the Americas um, in the beginning of uh, Europeans founding it. And a lot of beaver tail fat 
was uh, used um, for in, in commerce. I mean, that, that was like the, one of the main commerce was uh, beaver tail um, extracting the fat from that. Yeah, that's awesome. Actually, uh, I didn't know that um, the fat was used in that way, but it would make sense. You know, you don't want to waste uh, any part of the, uh, the creature. I think they even used uh, its bones, um, you know, to, to bring it back and use it as fertilizer as well. Um, uh, just like the in the whaling episode, we talked about it. Uh, you <laughs> wouldn't really waste anything unless you had to or it, the other parts were just so valuable that you wanted to save room for for them, like the, the furs of the beaver or the blubber of the whale. Um, but so at this point, yes, it was a, a yearly profit of 200% uh, I, for all the invested capital oh uh, my gosh. under Prince Rupert. But as I mentioned before, we're share this uh, meme for a brief that, time, the Duke of York, sorry, uh, I, I, the brother I know of the someone's King, probably into this, but I'm going to share this himself, meme that Typo sent me. Um, just kind of dithered about um, and made some very uh, un, uh, unprofitable decisions regarding the company. And so I believe it was uh, in... Yeah, for two years, he was uh, governor of the Hudson's Bay Company. And in 1685, they realized that they needed uh, not just a new governor, but another Prince Rupert, someone who could, you know, steer them in the uh, right direction. And so they so wrong. decided to elect uh, a very well-connected uh, but highly intelligent member of the court, uh, the Right Honorable John Lord Churchill, who later became the Duke of Marble. Uh, Marlborough. <laughs> um, now, if that name sounds familiar, it's because he is the great, 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 great. Oh, he's nine generations a older lot of greats. than Sir Winston Churchill. Wow. Uh, and who wrote Bloods, uh, a lot about the man. He was a very great statesman, uh, obviously a successful businessman, as we'll find out. Um, uh, and also a good tactician uh, in a later war. But the reason they, uh, this was very providential for the Hudson's Bay Company is because uh, after, in these previous years, and seeing great success, uh, France was getting jealous. Remember, England and France were the primary uh, colonizers and settlers of North America. Um, and they were, uh, officially, their kings and their governments wanted to expand uh, their settlements there. They not only wanted to increase their control of the raw materials, but as I mentioned before, England has a huge economy for manufactured goods. What they wanted to have happen was send as many people, their excess population that was filling up their cities uh, and, and villages and doing nothing, their convicts, whoever, send them over to the new world, create uh, small colonies on their own, reap the raw materials of lumber, uh, furs, the masculine uh, urge, metals and ores that they could find there, the and reap, send them back to trade. Bounty of the land uh, for manufactured goods that they would then use to live a more civilized life in the new world. Hell yeah, brother! However, success really. brought a lot of problems. Garbage. And France and, and England I don't mean often engage in bitter hostilities. Colonialism. Uh, talking about our soon headed lives. for another uh, conflict. The French themselves have been trading with the Algonquin, sometimes the Cree and other groups um, along the St. Lawrence River. Uh, and they found that their uh, returns were becoming shorter the more the Hudson's Bay Company operated. As I mentioned before, the Cree were trading with everyone around them in order to get as many pelts as they could. And this severely impacted the, uh, the profits for the French. Ooh. So uh, after years of playing second fiddle, they decided to strike. And uh, they attacked several Hudson's Bay companies. Guys, this is outposts. so good. There's only like 20 um, people here. And one particular leader uh, of the French was a, let me pull up his name. He was a native of New France called uh, De Berville. Uh, and he was one of the greatest captains in the war, probably the greatest uh, captain and soldier in the history of New France. So moving into uh the, he, he attacked several forts over the years sometimes he made overland passage or taking small uh rivers through rapids and over mountainsides in order to get to uh, the forts from land where they were least expecting an attack other times he sailed ships in in fact uh in one campaign he sailed in and took uh four or five um massive forts around hudson's bay um, often by outwitting the occupants, thinking that they, he had more troops uh, and more ships on the way than they actually did. Uh, so they would often surrender with it 
uh, to this inadequate force. However, at one point, he was sailing back along the bay after having just captured another fort where he was confronted by several ships, including the 52-gun warship, the Hampshire. And reading here, what ensued was the Battle of Hudson's Bay. They had never seen anything as spectacular as two European warships blasting each other with broadsides, cannons firing one after the other. In this time, the standard tactic uh, for naval warfare was one ship would sail past another, or rather each other, and once as many of their guns were pointed on the enemy ship as possible, they would fire. Ideally, before the other ship fired at you, it was a game of chicken. Could you line up all or most of your cannons and fire before the other captain could? Because once they did, they could knock out uh, your captain, some of your cannons, your crews, your masts, and you would be stranded. Well, Deberville in his single ship was facing five enemy warships. And they expected him to surrender. After all, it was it would be crazy for him to go against them. But Deberville was a little crazy. So he charged at the Pelican, which was a uh, smaller warship um, that was cruising ahead of the, the main armada. And they were hitting each other with small shot, ripping at the rigging and wounding a few sailors on board. They were yelling and screaming at each other as they uh, got closer. And the smell of gunpowder was blowing about, filling everyone's eyes. Before they uh, committed to a broadside, the captain of the, uh, the Pelican uh, demanded Deberville's surrender, and he refused. So they set another broads or they set apart, <laughs> they set upon broadsiding each other. And after a few rounds, the Pelican. Uh, oh, I apologize. The Pelican was the uh, the name of Deberville's uh, ship, but the Pelican uh, fired at the Hampshire and managed to uh, incapacitate it. And the Hampshire sank, killing four, uh, 40 sailors as well as the captain immediately. The next company ship, the Royal Hudson's Bay, charged the French Pelican. They also uh, sent out a broadside, but the Pelican shot once, disabled the mast, and they quickly surrendered before they died. Another group of uh, ships, uh, the remaining Good three move, ships, uh, sailed towards them. Uh, however, yourselves. the Pelican was able to maneuver themselves Fight another day. and was not, uh, attempting to, to board the Royal Wind. Hudson's Bay, the ship that North they just incapacitated, before the storm drove away one of the other ships, uh, and they soon fled south to their other fort. Um, but the storm and the high winds took the Pelican and the remaining Hudson's Bay ship and drove them against the shallows, stranding them. They began to sink, and the uh, Deberville took his crew uh, onto shore. They all survived uh, and marched back to a fort where they uh, resupply. But it is, I believe, the only warship battle that took place in Hudson's Bay. Uh, and it was won because the, uh, the French captain laughed in the face of the, uh, the British power. Uh, they would continue to fight, uh, you know, not just here, but in settlements all across uh, North America. Uh, and it wouldn't be resolved until the uh, Treaty of uh, Utrecht, uh, which ultimately returned the Hudson's Bay outpost to the British. Um, the French made uh, several uh, concessions, including returning these outposts uh, and a lot of uh, recognizing the trading rights uh, that they held in their royal charter. Now, it doesn't mean that they would always it's about who has them, authorities, but uh, it just goes to show you Hard that enforce, uh, but even though recognize the first it. royal charter gave them, you know, access and the right to sole trade and absolute rulers of this land, it's only as good as you can defend it. But for the next 250 or so years, the British would continue to successfully defend it. Yes, um, that'll do it. Marlon, so far, we've just been going over the uh, early history, but uh, I'd if you could uh, maybe introduce yourself Gosh, and also share a bit about a while. Uh, your connection to the Hudson's Bay. Uh, I know everyone here would appreciate hearing a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've grown up. Uh, oh. um, it's not, uh, I, don't, I don't hide it. I'm a, I'm a New England nationalist. I, I, I've grown up in the area. Um, oh, I didn't know that. And Him too. I've sailed the Hudson Bay. I grew up um, with, a, with a laser. Uh, I'm currently looking at a 36-foot sailboat uh and from connecticut i fished the hudson uh the saint lawrence as well i i, I fish walleye every year in in the hudson i mean i'm not in the not in the hudson but the the saint lawrence um where is the saint and lawrence? controlling the 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 waterways is a very 
uh, important part uh, of of politic, really. It, if you can control the waterways, it's northern New uh, England, you control the. Trade. Yeah, I gotta, uh, and that's do this. Uh, that's really I what it's it upgrade comes down my to, thing. But uh, when it comes what I'll to, do for now, uh, economics. JC, so are you still there? Can you, you tell know, me if the audio changes? Because I'm gonna try to do this in a different way, and I, I think it what, might what, harm what, the audio. Uh, so we'll see. Era we're talking about currently. Well, but it really does. Come I'm gonna do it now. So bear with me for a moment, please. Newfoundland. How's the audio and quality it, there, it brother? If you want to mind telling me, just to get be on the list to um, go catch some of the because here's the thing with the brook trout. I'm I'm, I'm going to go out uh, go off on some complete tangents here. Um, the Did brook trout the quality is, there. When you get into Native American lore, um, Native Americans wouldn't even eat brook trout. It sounds fine, because, but did it change? Uh, if you look at a brook trout. It is the, one of the most beautiful patterned trout. Um, that you 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 you'll ever see in your life, and I've caught I've caught these, but uh, unfortunately we've overfished them, so they don't really get above, you know, twelve to thirteen inches um, in the Northeast so politics, in America. Really, it, but it, if, if you, you can control the waterways, fish, northern uh, in can, uh, Newfoundland um, or Labrador, Labrador, really, Labrador but, but if, if you, you can control the waterways, the northern in uh, uh, Newfoundland, but, uh, you have to release it um oh slightly better trapping. okay thanks um I'm, cool i'm, I'm improving my familiar, my audio uh because uh hardware I, I, and I software into getting soon. my trapping license uh, i'd be curious to talk to um your other co-host uh who I, I i believe you mentioned has a trapping license me using this um it's not something that i'm experienced with i'm experienced with uh bird hunting um you know uh big game hunting to an extent but Big mostly summer. fishing um and the hudson river was really uh is Thanks, really JC. i appreciate it brother uh, in and now i can show stuff in while trade, i leave within it america on. within so, new england uh it's, it's probably the most important riverway and you need control for myself back in the other the, corner i don't the think the waterways there, sweet. If, if you want to control anything yeah Definitely. Um, oh, that quality yeah, no, is not good. Uh, but... I don't believe Vandy has his uh, trapping license, but uh, Vandy, did you have any experience uh, hunting or? Uh... No, I, uh, that, you must have been thinking about someone else. I don't have a trapping license. I do know okay. someone. Uh, it's actually a, a Canadian man. He's, uh, he's quite old, but he lives uh, somewhere along the north side of uh, Lake Huron, and he has a, a trapping territory. I think over there uh, in, I think it's Ontario. They have, uh, they give out oh, certain licenses in certain areas that you're allowed to, uh, well, kind of like a charter oh. that you're uh, able to trap on. Uh, but he's been trapping since he was, God, like probably like 14, 15 years old. He's got to be like getting close to 70 now. Uh, and he knows the waterways. In fact, uh, I don't think he, I think he owns a car and I think he got it 20 years ago. Was he now? He's like, yeah. But before that, he grew up on boats. Uh, they, they didn't even build roads to the town that he grew up in until like the 60s or 70s uh, because there wasn't really a need to, uh, to drive around. So you're right, it is the waterways and, and subsisting off the land. Yeah, and, and, and like I mentioned earlier, I, I would like to, I, I don't know if you've already overcovered it, but the beaver is um, like the original America... The, the original, um, what would you say? The, uh, the you mean like the symbol? Not the symbol, but the uh, the, the the trade. The um, mm. not the dollar, but like what would be the the gold standard? Currency. The currency. Yes, the beaver was really the currency of the original. The, the original. Americans, um, because it's the reserve a, currency, right? The fur, uh, but B also, I mentioned the, the fat within the tail. Um, you could use that for candles. You could use that for, um, you know, shining your boots, uh, winterizing your boots. Uh, there, there was, there's a lot of 
commerce uh, and economic value with the beaver. You get it. Um, Different kinds. And a great movie for this. And I'm sure everybody's seen it and it's, uh, it's not going to blow your mind, but like the revenant, um, check my analytics, that era, I can't was the era of, uh, beaver trapping, uh, um, 8,000, I need 60,000 uh, every day. That, that was get probably the hottest commodity for a while. uh, during that time period was, was trapping beavers. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we we spoke a little bit earlier about um, sort of the the tactic of like killing uh, beavers, you know, breaking open the lodge and tracking where they uh, went. Uh, and this was because they, these areas were being beavered out. Um, the Cree and a lot of the local groups uh, didn't uh, weren't able to sort of keep up with the the, the demand for them, uh, and so they sent out other hunters uh, from the Hudson's Bay Company uh, yeah. to hunt what they could. But eventually, this you know they were finding them few and far between as well and you couldn't spend all day hunting you know two beaver it just wasn't economical so this actually led to the development of the spring-loaded trap uh and of course the occupation of trappers oh, gosh. so instead of having to you know spend all day I wonder how many human legs had to get amputated these, because of this uh, these sly and quick swimming beaver uh you could just lay a certain amount of traps around their lodges or where you think that they would be um walking nearby uh, and then you just had to check them, you know, maybe once a week and you'd be able to uh, set as many traps as you could find uh, beaver lodges, beaver dams, uh, and just, you know, every few days uh, wander through to see if you caught anything and reset the trap. Have you gone over the, have you, have you gone over the, um, I, I think you did. Yeah. I think I, when, when I first joined, you went over, um, it was like 200, 300% uh, on the economic value of beavers, but um so like i i have personally um and it, this was actually one in a raffle uh i'm involved with a uh organization that uh teaches young teaches older who? adults oh. um how to hunt who didn't grow up. like i grew up my father was a fisherman um but he wasn't a hunter i want to put some ambiance uh, on so here but i'm not sure if that would be allowed to, a hard line for somebody to grow up like myself who didn't grow up with a father who was a hunter to get into hunting um if you don't have a father to, to teach you how to do that well, like, I, I know YouTube, guys there is to know really about star wars because i Oliver Anthony. grew up with it but sorry I, it's boring I, me right I, now i want them to talk more about fur traders gosh i can't say that i know these people i can't, uh, I can't say kind of try to be funny me learn I don't mean it hunt um, and I entered a raffle where they were raffling off a, a firearm a day in the month of July. Because I know I, I know figured that. I wouldn't win anything. Um, right. Anything, I'd, I'd win like uh, one of the 22s. This but I ended up winning is uh, the guy. I, I knew I knew it. Knew it. I seen it. This um, is the guy was given to that the I pioneers one of the guys the whose dugout canoe videos um, helped me with mine. Do he was probably the main through oh that's that, awesome that i Revenant forgot that he was this period. guy well i, I love his that, clothes but, um, i haven't bought any because they're very expensive you know, but i love the to idea scout west because <clears throat> it could take i mean you, you you look at one of these rounds um it can take down a grizzly bear um i mean you you look at it and it's, it's like half the size of your uh your schmeckle um it, there's 300 grains of of, of uh, gunpowder in this thing, and it's a 45 caliber round. Um, it's 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 powerful, um, and I I ended up winning that in the raffle on on the last day of the raffle. My my buddy texted me. I wasn't even paying attention because I just I just gave them money, and he was like, "Dude, go online right now. Look 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 at the raffle." Yeah, uh, that's and, a that's a great find, and um, uh, you're right. Like. The muskets and the rifles, they allowed them to go further than they, they ever had before. Uh, actually, I did want to go and talk a bit more about exploration. Uh, I know Vandy has a lot of uh, knowledge about the Lewis and Clark expedition. Before that, I did want to touch on something. But uh, Vandy, did you have anything you want to bring up before we dive back in? No, why, why don't you go for it? All right, cool. Um, so where we left off was the, the Treaty of uh, Utrecht which was uh, a peace made between the, the French and the British, which restored ownership of a lot of these forts and outposts back to England uh, and the Hudson's Bay Company. So uh, 
obviously during this time they weren't operating at capacity if they had british you know workers there they were constantly in fear that they would either be attacked or they would be abused by their uh, french um how to say supervisors uh and because of this uh conflict a lot of the cree refused to trade with them as well uh so business was bad for a few years however in uh, 1714 they uh sent veteran administrator james knight to reclaim what would be what is and uh, i guess was at some point uh, the headquarters of hudson's bay company at york factory uh, which is in the where they have province. Did I just turn that off, or is that been, that been off for a while? Now, James Knight. Uh, James Knight was an interesting character. He was not a nobleman. In fact, a lot of the people working uh, and the people who managed the Hudson's Bay Company were not nobility. They weren't gentlemen. You know, the official uh, sort of semi nobility in England uh, at the time. Uh, he actually joined the company as a carpenter when he was young. Uh, and he worked his way up through the ranks for uh, for several years until he became the chief factor uh, of Fort Albany. Now, during the, uh, I believe he was on the board of directors during the war with the French when a lot of the uh, forts were captured. But in 1714, he was sent back out to take possession of York Factory and with the goal of revitalizing trade in the area. Uh, now, he was very uh, successful at doing that in the past and he proved to be uh, incredible, uh, incredibly successful again uh, at York Factory. So uh, starting in uh, 1714, uh, I believe he came into contact with uh, not a member of the Cree, but a member of the Chippewan. So this is another group, and they primarily lived uh, further into Manitoba. In fact, uh, a lot of their territory in the north stretched to the province of Alberta. Uh, which, you know, there's uh, several provinces that take up the Great Plains and stretch into the, the north or the northwest territories, and that's Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, before you hit the Rocky Mountains. Uh, so this is a vast uh, claim of territory that was sparsely populated by uh, mainly nomad nomadic groups. Uh, so I have the name of the uh, Chippewan woman, uh, and I'm only going to say it once, Thana Delther. Um, she's also known as Jumping Martin, uh, but she was captured by Cree raiders, her and another woman who managed to escape uh, before being uh, picked up by members of the Hudson's Bay Company. So the Heroes, Chippewan uh, were kind of getting a raw deal Maybe. from the Cree. Um, it's, you know, in the past, um, what would it have been like uh, 70 to 80 years since the Hudson's Bay Company was operating? Um, they, uh, the Cree have risen in power. They've been using their muskets and trading power to sort of dominate the area uh, and and take other groups as slaves. In fact, the tribe of the Chippewan that uh, Jumping Martin belonged to were just called the slaves because that's all the Cree knew them as. So they, they just called them that. Um, so she was brought into the uh, to York factory and she met James Knight. And uh, right away, they, uh, they hit it off. James Knight was one of those very intelligent uh, members of the company who learned the customs and languages of the locals at the time. So uh, he was able to converse with Jumping Martin and he talked to her and she told him about uh, her people. And she very cleverly you know, told him uh, aspects that would interest him. She not only mentioned that their uh, beaver and uh, you know, so animals back. were plentiful and even larger and had much better fur than the kind that you can find in the swamplands surrounding the Hudson's Bay. But she also told him uh, tales of handfuls of shining metals that you could find near uh, cliff sides and caves, find near uh, dry cliff sides and caves. Uh, this could be copper or even gold. Uh, and it became trying to link uh, people a sort to of it. obsession for the next few years. But uh, she didn't do this out of the kindness of her heart. She was very uh, smart to mention that it was very difficult or it would be very difficult for her to open trade between the Chippewan and the Hudson's Bay Company and deliver these furs and oars um, because the Cree were constantly at war with them hmm. and their trading routes would be uh, stopped and um, raided before they got there. So Knight, uh, having become this cultural li liaison between uh, the Chippewan and the Cree, brought some Cree leaders together and said, we need to form a peace between these people. So together, in a large band, uh, they began 
going back to the Chippewa to uh, to set peace between them. And he it was is a long just and trying to say Chippewa, uh, right? Like, or is this a group I don't uh, know Cree about? Decided to abandon. In fact, at one point, some of the group broke off and managed to uh, kill and attack uh, other Chippewa um, uh, travelers that had been in the area before they got to them. Uh, the knight and Jumping Martin were able to sort of like stop them from uh, continuing on. And by the time they made it to the Chippewa, uh, Jumping Martin made overtures and a deal was struck. And so now Knight had access to yet another massive area uh, that also fell within his um, uh, his royal charter uh, to have sole trading rights over. So he was doing his uh, his job very How successfully. How to promote your buddies for a number also, of years. Also, it's just fantastic um, work. I, I'm so he, happy to be a part of stuff like this. You a know? lot of money and profits through York. Thanks Factory. for your support, and everybody listening. The board of the direct, even if you're not saying anything, but especially JC, I appreciate work, you. But Knight I'm sorry, I'll shut wasn't. Up. He was happy because he made a lot of money, but he was not born into nobility. He didn't care how much money he had uh, saved up in his coffers. He wasn't going to go back to England to settle in a uh, in a estate house. He wanted something more, and he kept, his mind kept going back to the shining medals that Jumping Martin had uh, had spoken about all those years ago. So after a number of years, in uh, 1719. He decided to uh, approach his See what the map approach management like. and tell them that he wouldn't be continuing on mm -hmm. as a, uh, a factor yeah, um, for the uh, for York you, factory. Instead, he wanted to is. ask them you, if you he could go on a voyage that. to seek out the thing that uh, began the Hudson's Bay Company uh, in the beginning, the Northwest Passage. Now, again, it had been a long time since anyone gone looking, uh, and there's multiple reasons for this. It wasn't just the fact that there might was, have to go. Uh, mm -hmm. It was almost impossible to navigate the rock and the ice that existed at the north of uh, Hudson's Bay. Uh, and it wasn't even the fact that uh, many men had died. Uh, going Show LARPing value some love, in man. Fact, he does he not have the amount of followers he should have. Themselves. This is something I mentioned uh, early on just before the space began. But this idea that the Hudson's Bay Company was a force for colonization is complete uh, farce. It's the opposite. Uh, you see, the Hudson's Bay Company had a right to a certain amount of land. And it was very clear to them at this point that it was much larger than uh, it should have been when it was first given to them. The, the tributaries, the rivers, the lakes that fed into the Hudson's Bay uh, was going on and on and on. Um, and they were meeting more people, more territory. And they were very happy about that. And they were happy to continue to uh, maintain these outposts and Appreciate maybe make that, overtures to the groups that live further and further away. Show you guys this on a map. But what would happen if you start bringing shiploads of settlers and settling uh, Fort Albany? It's like 1,000. Uh, Factory or, uh, or George Fort. Um, what you would have is European settlers, British settlers. And they would, you know, maybe farm and maybe hunt and deplete the stock of uh, pelts and furs that were in the area. But even if they bought them from the Hudson's Bay Company, they would need more items. They would need knives and forks. They would need bowls. They would need muskets. They would need all the uh, all the comforts of their homes in England. And they would get them because there was no law saying that they couldn't. So now you had an influx of manufactured goods, which would distort the value that they could trade uh, with for the, the Cree in the area. JC, the, uh, the other nations. Um, so it was actually much better for the Hudson's Bay Company to keep these small outposts along the bay instead of having to uh, expand the here. settlement and interrupt or bring in new competition. However, they couldn't outright say that because part of the charter demanded that Denmark. where possible they would exert resources in they? order to find a passage to the Orient. And now here they have oh. one of their chief factors asking to do just that. They legally could not stop him, but they didn't have to help him all too much either. So Knight uh, told the company of his plans. They tried to uh, this is all happening. persuade him, but he was undeterred. This is leading so up to these events. In 1719, no. determined to find the Northwest Passage, he it does uh, exist, but it would go through here. Put together a crew and took two ships, the Albany and the discovery 1645 the name is familiar because of what happened HMS to discovery. hudson and unfortunately he's going to meet with yeah, a similar true. end they continued up Colonies. to the top of hudson's bay this and they didn't the get much further talked about this earlier in the space for those who were here uh, they disappeared after several 
months. No one heard from them. They asked the Chippewan, they asked the Cree that were coming down and delivering uh, pelts. And the last they had been seen was the that's uh, the year, the the fall before the winter. A year went by. Two years went by. No search party was sent out. It wasn't until many years later that a another governor uh, or future governor of the Hudson's Bay Company stumbled upon two shipwrecks uh, on Marble Island near the top of Hudson's Bay. What happened is a little gruesome. What was obvious when they found the bodies, uh, says company adventurer Samuel Hearn, was that they had first uh, built a small brick building uh, made from the, the bricks and the wood that they brought with them on the two ships. They had limited supplies. There were several graves dug, and they learned from the local Inuit what happened in their final days. He says, sickness and famine occasioned such, such havoc among the English that by the setting in of the second winter, their number was reduced to 20. But by the spring, only five men remained, and the survivors were in such distress for provisions that they eagerly ate the seal's flesh and whale's blubber quite raw. Side note, I just looked at a time zone map of Europe. ordered them much so. I figured that died in a few days. And the other two, the France would be Greenwich Mean Time because it's like them. above England. But no. many days after wow. the rest. It's all one time Frequently, zone. They went to the top of America's really big, guys. And earnestly looked like at the, the USA East, as if in expectation of some vessels coming to their relief. After continuing there a considerable time together, and nothing appearing in sight, they sat down close together and wept bitterly. At length, one of the two died. And the other's strength was so far exhausted that he fell down and died also in attempting to dig a grave for his companion. One second. They believed until the end that help was coming from the Hudson's Bay. But it was not coming. There would be other tries in the future to seek the Northwest Passage. And eventually, one, in a way, would be found. But the Hudson's Bay continued their policy of dissuading anyone from trying to venture forth beyond the mouth of the rivers. But many continue to try. There are a few more stories, but at this point, I'd like to hear from Vandy uh, if you have some more stories to share. We spent a lot of time in Canada uh, the last uh, hour or so, but um, perhaps we should uh, venture a bit more to the south. What do you think? Sure, yeah, let's uh, bring the focus down to the United States of America. I think that sounds great. I've got right. some stuff too. I've got right. some stuff too outside um, of the U.S. If we, I'm sorry, guys. There, I I will be right go back. Ahead. I'm going to leave this um, on because I think it'll they'll right. probably go for a while. They tend to do that, that, and I don't want to miss we, it. But we, I, I got to go the past hang space. out with my girlfriend for a little bit. I've been streaming for like five hours. Okay. Um, well, um, I think what I, I, I've always been really interested in this era of history. Um, I've spent a lot of time. Um, learning about the, the just being from the American West, you know, it's part of the school curriculum growing up. You learn all about the trappers and the mountain men. Um, I think I, I posted a thread about this not too long ago, but one thing that I think is often wrong that people get wrong about this era of, you know, settlement and exploration in North America is the idea of how abundant the animals were and how few the natives were. Um, I, I don't know if you if you remember this, but it's it's actually it's, it's actually kind of backwards. You know, when when Lewis and Clark were heading up the Missouri River, and you read their journals, it's like nonstop animals, right? He, they're talking about like the herds of buffalo that extend to the horizon, and they're talking about all their encounters with you know grizzly bear and elk and pronghorn. It's just it's nonstop, right? But they don't talk about the Indians like all that often. I think when they were heading up the Missouri, they it was it was quite a while before they even like reached their first um, native tribe. They met some Sioux on the way up the Missouri, and then they eventually got to the Mandan village where they spent their first winter. But um, but like I said, this while that's all it's all correct. That that was what these explorers um we're, we're experiencing it's actually kind of a historical anomaly that happened because of all of the uh epidemics that happened to the indian populations right so like when when the first explorers were reaching north america 
they were like they described like when they were in when they were coming up on new england they described like wall-to-wall villages right so like columbus comes in 1492 and for the next like 100 years in north america there were probably hundreds of ships operating right on the coast right english ships italian spanish ships every, french ships they're all going all up and down the coast of north america there were like, like you said there were a lot of like rich smart guys trying to figure out like how to exploit this this new land but there were just too many indians and so it took about a hundred years for like the the epidemics to really set in and to start reducing populations and it wasn't just smallpox um that it was all sorts of different diseases there was like hepatitis a there was you know uh, measles all sorts of things that that were decimating these indian tribes and so so the era of like the 1500s and the 1600s those 200 years were the era of when like the indians like had their apocalypse right they had like 90 percent of their populations decimated um and and what happened was the the indians who were you know the, the entire continent of north america was chock full like when when de soto was going through the american south he starts up in florida and kind of winds his way through like georgia alabama mississippi texas okay now i'm leaving he for here i didn't realize plains. i was on the camera the whole time but i was uh, he, he's describing the same last thing. Notes, but i'll like, be right back wall-to-wall -wall villages extensive um croplands farms in, in all directions um and he's not talking about like the abundance of animals so i think that's one thing to keep in mind here is that like when you had these hudson bay trappers and when you had the first um, american explorers like uh, lewis and clark or zebulon pike um, and john jacob astor and they're coming west they're experiencing a landscape that has been in apocalypse mode for the last 200 years and so what happened is like as these indian tribes were decimated they were the ones who were keeping animal populations in check so there are there's academic papers on this where they look at like they, they make estimates for like the buffalo tribe like the buffalo populations on the great plains and there's archaeological evidence that these buffalo populations just exploded right and the thing the same things were happening with you know other large game elk um i don't know if if, if you could get into like if, if beaver would qualify but in in large part um the the abundance of animals was just due to the depopulation of the natives well it it, it to, to my point earlier and to exactly your point that you just said now even the the brook trout i, I this was on a, a, an account that i've had long ago um i, I wrote a, a thread on the brook trout uh which is mostly native to the northeast um uh, again the largest pop like the largest growth population is up in Newfoundland and um, Labrador because they have very strict regulations on mm -hmm. how you can get into that. But Native Americans would not eat. Uh, they, they consider them the uh, brook trout as sacred, just based on the the patterns uh, of their skin. I mean, I've caught many brook trout, and they are beautiful to catch. Um, the the patterns are like nothing you've ever seen in your life, and uh you know we as as europeans we've kind of overfished them um and it, i'm guilty of, of it as well i mean I, I've, I've caught brook trout in new hampshire and and cooked them up over the fire uh but in in response to that you, you know you don't really get brook trout over uh you know 10 to 12 inches when you know when when you have a they they used to grow to 36 inches uh, you know three feet yeah you're keeping the population in check yeah yeah so one one guy that is pretty popular in like if you're into like fur trappers in this era of history like you've probably heard of osborne russell he wrote a book well he, he had a journal um he it, there's a book published it's called journal of a trapper nine years in the rocky mountains um there he he wasn't like a particularly um accomplished or famous guy like in his day he did go on to like serve in like some government positions in oregon um but he's famous because he kept a really good record right like there were tons of these 
trappers like you mentioned this lv earlier there's hundreds and dozens of these guys we don't even know their names who are just ranging all over this continent you know we sometimes think that like lewis and clark were the first white guys to cross the continent and they reached the pacific ocean i bet there were dozens before lewis and clark that did it you just don't know about them there actually was one like british guy in canada who reached the pacific ocean before lewis and clark i think he is like the expedition was like totally decimated and he kind of reached some cave on the coast and like carved his name into the rock and then died or something. I Samuel Hearn. Hard. Yeah. He was yeah. a governor for the Hudson's Bay company. Uh, he had crazy adventures, but yeah, go on. Yeah. So there's probably just, there's, there's lots of these guys ranging all over the West. Um, so Osborne Russell, he, he joins up with, he's, he's from Maine. So I'll just kind of do a short bio on, on Osborne Russell, he's kind of a case study for like the American fur trapper. Um, he He's from Maine, he heads west, he joins up with a fur trapping crew in um, Independence, Missouri, kind of like the frontier at the time. This is like in the early 1820s. This is like uh, that, that early era, you know, post-war of 1812, you know, um the louisiana territory andrew jackson it's kind of that era um he he joins up with this guy named wyeth and they were going to go and try to take supplies up to the oregon territory and, and at this time you got to remember like the oregon territory it goes all the way to like uh montana and wyoming right um that's it's, it's all those mountains basically where the great plains stop once you get into the mountains that's what they called like Oregon or Oregon Territory. So they um, they headed up into this this area and Osborne Russell, he's a his journal's really interesting because he he's a young guy. And as you kind of like follow along with his adventures in the Rocky Mountains, you like get the sense that he's like really proud of himself for like learning the trade of trapping and becoming a mountain man. And he's always talking about how he's getting better and he's learning more skills and like he, uh, he, he's learning how to hunt better. And so, and, and the other thing is he's always talking about like how beautiful the land is. Like a lot of these guys were really like, they were romanticists, like about what they were doing. They loved the American West and they loved what they were doing. They thought it was the most beautiful place in the world. And they all felt lucky to be there. Um, but Osborne Russell and his crew. So he, he's with like a, a contracted company. Turns out that the Wyeth guy wasn't very good at being a leader you you kind of mentioned this with other like with henry hudson he wasn't a very good leader either um the, these american guys they would kind of form like crews right so like you'd get together with another 10 or 12 guys and you'd kind of have a leader but desertion rates were really high you'd have a lot of guys just say hey i can do this better on my own i'm gonna go trap by myself so there were a lot of independent trappers out there who were just living off the land you know trap you know trapping their pelts they would um rather than haul all their pelts around with them all the time they would store them in caches so they would dig holes try to remember where they are figure out ways to preserve the beaver pelts and hide them and they'd come back in a year and pick them all up and take them to the rendezvous so the rendezvous is a big part of like the american west and they, it was always held in this area um around where south pass is in western wyoming kind of northern utah western wyoming um and that's where all the mountain every single year they would choose a spot and you'd probably you'd get hundreds of mountain men that would converge on the annual rendezvous um there uh, they'd have like 600 or 800 of these like guys just show up and they they'd spend like a month i think it was like in august so that kind of lines up what you're what you were saying about like it was, it was in august I haven't, yeah. I haven't i haven't heard about the rendezvous i haven't like read about it in a long time but this is all yeah. coming back to me now yeah so, so the rendezvous is where you'd have like these um supply companies operating out of independence missouri and this, none of this was like royal charter stuff. Like the, the Americans were way more freewheeling um, than like having some like big monopoly. So they, you, you'd have independent companies that would bring supplies from independence up to the rendezvous. 
they meet the mountain men, trade them for like supplies, you know, buy the pelts. And then you'd have like the guys bring it back down the Platte River, down the Missouri River, back to uh, Independence, and then, you know, sell it, you know, down downstream into the European and American markets, right? So that's kind of how the economy of it all worked. Um, these, these guys, as, as they were kind of living off the land, what was really incredible is that like they actually could. Like one thing that I was struck by in Osborne Russell's journal was how often they were just killing animals to eat. Like they'd say like, he, he would write, he's like, we, we set up camp for the night. One of the guys went and shot an elk and then we ate like its tongue and its heart. And then like we went to bed and then like the next day they'd say, we shot another elk and then we like ate its tongue and its heart and some organs and you know and that was dinner so every it was like the the fast food restaurant for him was just like killing another animal like that's how many there were out there it's like oh we killed a but we killed we went and killed 10 buffalo today right and we ate their tongues for breakfast and dinner or whatever and so and there was sometimes it'd be like oh we couldn't find we couldn't find an animal tonight so we went hungry um it was one of those things that kind of just really drove home the idea that like this this whole area was just like bursting with animals and at the same time though he would often have their their anecdotes in there about how they would just come across like indian villages that were filled with bodies and they say oh we looked in the 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 teepee and there were you know three dead indians and we left that place you know like they're they're coming across just like they're, they're just experiencing death daily um, yeah. out there. I, I, the question on that. I know Marlon's got a, a question, but I just wanted to know, uh, does he write about how any of the Europeans um, suffered like from any of these diseases? Like, cause it sounds like it's either only affecting the, uh, the Indians or they're just taking it so much worse, but does he, does he have any information or journal entries about uh, like his fellow trappers suffering from it? Yeah, there were instances like he they, they would spend like all winter together kind of hold up. Um, like, for example, they, they, they spent their winters usually in uh, the, the Snake River Valley in Idaho. And they'd have guys die from diseases. So, yeah, it's not like unheard of. Right. And, and it usually happened when they came into contact with like other groups of guys. Right. Because like. If you're just by yourself out in the wilderness, you're not going to get sick. You're not interacting with anybody. But when they get together for winters or rendezvous or they'd go into Indian villages, that's usually when like diseases are passed around. So, yeah, it wasn't unheard of at all, but it happened all the time. If, if I could jump in, I, I, I love this topic uh, because, um, like you said, um, Vandy, it's it's people have no idea what it's like to live like this nowadays. Um, and I have over the last 15 years of my life, I have spent time out in the wilderness by myself. Um, and, you know, at, at most seven, eight days at a time, um, I know that I can uh, live uh, on my own uh regard for seven eight days at a time but these people were living like this for uh you know months and months at a time yeah. and it, it, not many people like when when people want to get into this kind of uh off-grid kind of living i recommend that they try three days um and you know i've done i've done to the extent of winter camping where it's negative five degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I've done, you know, seven, eight days out where you're relying on um, catching fish. Um, you know, I always bring potatoes with me. Uh, but it's it's not it's not easy living. And it's almost to me, it's a psychedelic experience, because it gives you an appreciation for the creature comforts that you have at home. Um, yeah. it, it really it really, when when you're stripped of everything, um and you you know you might go you might go without a meal if you don't if you don't catch your food for the day or shoot your food for the day yada yada but uh, uh, in 
a, a character that should be recognized in this space. Um, and he's a little later than the context that we're talking about, but his name is Dick Pranecki, R Richard Pranecki. He's been a major inspiration in my life. Um, he, um, he enlisted in the, in the Navy uh, after Pearl Harbor and he served as a carpenter. Um, but, uh, you know, in, around 1968, he had been a, a few years out of the war and, well, you know, 20 years out of the war. And he decided to uh, go up to Alaska and he was kind of the first. This is why I really don't like the book or the movie um, Alone in the Wilderness or alone, uh, the, the one with the, with the kid that goes out and... Um, Hatchet. What's that? Was it Hatchet? That book we all read in elementary no, school. No, it wasn't. It was Hatchet. It was. It was. So, Alone in the Wilderness is actually Dick Pernucky's book. But um, okay. the, kid, the kid that like drops out of school and he tries to go live alone in, a, in Alaska. Oh yeah, what's that called? And he dies. He finds a school bus and he poisons himself. What's yeah. it? Oh, uh, into the wild. Into, into the, the wild. wild. Yeah. Alexander McCandless. Yeah. 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 I remember this why I really. That. This is why I really don't like that because he really didn't do any preparedness to um like he he uh, look at i i like i said I've, I've spent seven days out in the wilderness out like in the remote wilderness where like you if you if you twist a leg i, I actually like fell into uh, a hole while having 80 pounds on my back and uh you know had to get myself out of that um with nobody to help like there's 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 nothing around you to help. And you've got 80 pounds in your back. You've fallen into a tree hole. Um, if, if, if I twisted an ankle, I'm 50 miles away from any sort of help. And, you know, so the, the, they're very real situations of kind of life or death, not yeah. life or death. Yeah, you know. Um, and, but Dick Pranecki is somebody that uh, I encourage anybody who's interested in this. He really did it well. And he has a there's a documentary on him and he actually wrote a book he he went away to alaska and he really did it. he built a, a log cabin um he went away from society and what the, the most important take back that i took from him is that he mentions that after 27 to 28 days you regain a sort of sixth sense um to where you kind of just know where the food is going to be. Um, you kind of get in back in tune with nature. Um, and, you know, he, like he could, he could walk out and just hold food in his hand and the birds would come feed off his hand. He, he, he would start canoeing and he would just know where the fish would be. He would um, go out in the woods and he would know where the elk or the deer would be. Uh, but he, he noted also that when, when he would go see his kids back in Anchorage, Alaska, um, as soon as he got back into the city, uh, within three days, that sixth sense was completely lost. So it really takes about 30 days of being out alone in the wilderness um, to, to gain that sixth sense back that we, we had for probably yeah, well, for most of human years. history. But uh, it sounds like this Osborne Russell guy had uh, probably had that himself. Yeah, I think the, the other thing that I'm always amazed by is how young these guys all are. Like um, Lewis from Lewis and Clark, I think he was 30 years old, like when he led the, the expedition to the Pacific. And Clark was like the old man of the group at like 34 years old. And the other like 18 guys in their crew were all, all in their 20s. So I'm 34 myself. I don't know if I could like lead an expedition to the Pacific over three years living off the land and like get back. I mean, I know I couldn't, right? Well, like, I'm 30 years old. I'm different times. Years old. And my, my plan B is uh, like my plan B exit plan is buy a 36 foot sailboat and grab four or five guys and we'll just see if we make it six months. Yeah, that would be rad. Like if you could, if you could actually do that, that would be so cool. 
but n nobody nowadays like has these skills or it's 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 very very rare that people today can even come close to matching just the survival capacities or capabilities or outdoorsmanship that these guys had back then I mean Shackleton I'm I I've got a I'm on my computer right now just looking up tabs and um this is also a little later than the the Hudson stuff but Shackleton's expedition um in the early, like early 1900s was probably the the gnarliest expedition that has ever been seen this was an Irishman uh, exploring Antarctica um but I mean the <laughs> I know, I think me and LV have talked about Shackleton before, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Shackleton, I, I forget what the book on him is. Um, uh, there's a few. I think The Terror, or that that's the show that they did. Um, the Endurance? Oh, uh, what's that? Yeah. Franklin? There's like but, a famous one everybody reads. I mean, Shackleton, Shackleton, like, is probably the most insane expeditionist we've we've seen in the last yeah and I, year. and I would like to do that but uh I, I do uh I do want to hear more from Vandy because like uh this is like I'm familiar with like the arctic and like the sailing portion uh well and also the canoeing portion now um and I spent a lot of time researching you know the Hudson's Bay Company but uh but this it fascinates me like this interior fur trade because uh, I think it's like the Mississippi tributaries. They go right across the country. Um, is that what like Russell and Lewis and Clark used? Like did they, were they primarily like canoe uh, and like using the rivers or were they going over land? Yeah. So Lewis and Clark, they, their, their idea and that like they, Lewis brainstormed this with Thomas Jefferson. They wanted to go up the Missouri river. Um, so they built like this, like boat, it was like a, it was like a sailing ship that they put on the Missouri, but pretty quickly they it was just like running aground all the time. Like the Missouri River is actually kind of shallow. Like they were hitting like sandbanks like five times a day, and so all of their crew would get out of the boat and they'd like pull it up the river. So it took them super long, and then they 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 hopped in canoes um, at a certain point, and they just like left the the boat and they stashed it. Um, so Lewis and Clark tried to use canoes. They crossed the Bitterroot Mountains. Then they used canoes. I think they like traded for some canoes from the Indians. They went down to Columbia and eventually got to a, um, the Pacific and came back. Most of these um, mountain men and trappers, though, they were just on horseback. Like there are no, like the the the, the Intermountain West doesn't have a ton of big navigable rivers the way the East does um the the colorado river is probably the one of the biggest ones out here and you have a lot of like headwaters for big rivers like the yellowstone and the missouri and the you know the, the platte rivers and the, the the colorado river green river but yeah they were just on horseback um and so what, what they'd kind of getting back to like the rendezvous um i i i posted about this earlier today or last night about South Pass. South Pass is like this geographical choke point in the continental United States. There isn't an easy way to get over the Rocky Mountains. And so um, they would they were all using South Pass. If you go north of South Pass, you're hitting the the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and the Bitterroot Mountains that you know that northern half of the Rockies. If you go south of it, you're hitting the Colorado Rockies and if you try to go south of the colorado rockies you're crossing the sonoran and mojave deserts so there's really not a good way to get across these mountains except for south pass um and so that's why all of these these rendezvous would happen right in this area so you would take the the platte river you'd follow the platte river usually like on a mule train or wagon train you wouldn't try to like canoe up the Platte River but you take a wagon train up the Platte you'd hit the Sweetwater River which is just a small river in in Wyoming it's not famous other than for this in this context you, you, you follow the Sweetwater River up to this area where the continental you follow it up to the continental divide and that's that's South Pass and like anybody going east and west 
would pass through there like it, for like a thousand miles north and south like it's the only it's like one of the only ways through so that's why they were all in this area but then they'd fan out so like jim bridger is a really famous mountain man from this era he kind of became like the head honcho mountain man man in like the 1820s and 1830s um you, you mentioned the revenant marlin but uh the kid there's like this young kid in the revenant like he's supposed to be jim bridger it's supposed to be like early in jim bridger's life because that was like around the turn of the eight, 18th uh, 19th century but jim bridger he'd go and organize these big expeditions because he he gained a reputation for being super competent right and people he did have leadership capabilities so he would actually at the rendezvous he'd gather up like 60 guys and then they'd go and say okay we're all gonna go trap around um you know three forks montana or something where the the yellowstone and the madison river and uh, you know they they all come together we're gonna in the missouri we're gonna go trap that area so they'd go like for the year they'd go up to that area they would fan out in teams they'd find a stream or a canyon and two of them would usually go up um, like a side canyon and just kind of lay their traps and spend a week up there. Like, you, like you were saying, you spend a week, then they check their traps and they'd head down and they'd go try another canyon. So they do this throughout the year and they kind of come back to like the main camp. Um, that's, that's how it worked with guys who were leading these expeditions like Jim Bridger. And then they'd all go back to like, the rendezvous point like the next year and trade all their goods and buy new stuff and find some Indian prostitutes or whatever. Um, do it all again the next year. Um, and then there were the independent guys like we like we talked about. There were a lot of independent guys. The big risk of being independent um, was the Indians. That's kind of why they stuck together. So even though you did have like the Indian apocalypse of the 1600s and 1700s, there's still a lot of Indians around. Um, the most brutal of the Indians in this area that was getting trapped heavily around Idaho and Wyoming and Montana were the, the Blackfeet Indians. Um, so they were always watching out for, for Blackfeet. And usually when you're reading the, the journals, the, these guys were actually pretty legitimately scared of the Blackfeet. I think just because of how barbaric they were. Um, they liked the Shoshone, the Shoshone Indians. The Shoshone Indians were like really meek. They weren't like warlike. And so the trappers liked them. They 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 raised horses. So they trade the Shoshone for horses. Um Sacagawea was Shoshone. Um so Lewis and Clark used her as like a translator to get across. You know, we all know that story. Well, actually, um, um, to be honest, uh, I, I took like a cursory overview, but uh, maybe you could give us like a bit of a summary, like how did that expedition come together? Um, and, yeah. you know, are there any details that stand out? Yeah, so it was like government, it was like U.S. federal government paid for. Thomas Jefferson was obsessed with like science. And so him and his like protege, uh, Meriwether Lewis, put this together uh, they funded it. It was like super hard to get it funded. Congress didn't want to like pay for it, but like they, they, the Congress passed an appropriations bill to fund the Lewis and Clark expedition. Um, and then after they left, they funded another one with uh, Zebulon Pike. So Pike went out to he he, he hit the Colorado Rockies, so like Pike's Peak, which is like above Colorado Springs. That was another like Thomas Jefferson expedition brainchild. But the idea was see if you can find a route to the Pacific, um, head up the Missouri. And then Jefferson wanted like all of like the naturalist science as well. So he, he trained Meriwether Lewis for like a few months. Um, he, he'd, he'd bring in all of the greatest naturalists in America. He'd bring them to Philadelphia and, you know, Meriwether Lewis would learn about how to like classify birds and plant species and he'd learn about like how to draw them and stuff so that was like another big part of it so they left they went up the missouri river um they left st louis that was like the starting point you know gateway to the west follow the missouri river and it took them like a year to get to what's now bismarck north dakota so they stayed with a village of mandan indians in bismarck it wasn't called Bismarck back then, but they stayed in Bismarck and wintered there. While in Bismarck, they found um, it 
the, the Mandan villages were kind of like this trading hub. So there were a bunch of like French and English guys at this Mandan village in North Dakota in 1802 or 1803, whichever year it was. Um, guys who were like Hudson Bay trappers, right? We're in North Dakota. One of these was a French guy. His name was Charbonneau. Um, Charbonneau had a Shoshone wife named Sacagawea. And so Lewis and Clark are there. They're spending the winter. They're thinking about the tribes that they have to like negotiate with to get um, to the Pacific. They all, they know about the Rocky Mountains. They know about the various tribes um, there. They, they know about the Sioux Indians. They know about the Blackfeet. They know about the Shoshone. And so uh, Sacagawea is like key to all of this because she was the only like Shoshone speaker that they knew of. And they knew that the Shoshone had horses. So they agreed to take Charbonneau along with them because they wanted his wife to come along. And Charbonneau was kind of like this sleazy guy and like they didn't really like him. And he like demanded a lot of things from them and stuff. And they really just needed like Sacagawea to come with them. So that's how he got to tag along on this. Um, so the next, when spring came, they continued going up the Missouri River. They're like killing tons of animals along the way. They're having a good time. They eventually get to uh, Great Falls, Great Falls of the Missouri, which is in Montana. Um, and they start hitting these mountains. They don't really know which way to go at this point. The Missouri River is getting smaller. There's more tributaries coming into it. They, they eventually kind of, this is like the area that Sekadui is from. So she actually kind of helped them like navigate through the area. She, she was from, um, it's called the Lemhi Valley. It's right on the border of Idaho and Montana. So she's from the, the Lemhi Valley. She kind of takes them through the area. They, they eventually find some other Shoshone. They barter for some horses. And then they, they're in the, the Bitterroot Valley of Montana which is like, it's like a wall of mountains. Like if you've ever been there, it's one of the most beautiful valleys in, in the United States, but they had to figure out a way to cross these mountains. They had a really, really super tough time. Like it was, you know, bushwhacking their way across, you know, a hundred miles of like some of the roughest terrain in North America. And they hired an Indian guide to take them, but like the Indian guy didn't really know where he was going. So they eventually drop down into the Columbia River Valley. And um, from there, it was pretty smooth sailing. They found, um, they, 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 they bartered for some canoes and uh, took the canoes down the Columbia River, which is just very wide. Um, there are some rapids in it, but it's a pretty navigable river. So they took it all the way down to the Pacific coast um, right near Astoria, Oregon. Um, they stayed the, the winter over there at, at Astoria on the mouth of the Columbia River. And at this point, they're like so far away from civilization, right? They, um, they're, they had just spent two years getting just across the continent and they still had to go back and they were, you know, out of things to like barter with the Indians. And so they were actually kind of discouraged about being able to like get all the way back. They were really not looking forward to going across the Bitterroot Mountains again, just because of how tough it was. Um, but they, yeah, they eventually made it back. Um, they, Lewis had all sorts of records. Um, he he kept good journals. He published his journals. They they kept like boxes of like animal species that they collected. So like and you know Lewis has like birds named after him and stuff because he was some of the first to like you know draw these new bird species. And so like the the National Geographic Society or whatever it was of its day like had a heyday with all of the the, the you know specimens and journals that they they brought back. So it was a it was a huge success. I think it took them, um, yeah, it was like three years or something. I forget if they got back in one year or two years. It must have been, I don't remember. But um, they got back and then uh, Thomas Jefferson made uh, Meriwether Lewis the governor of the Louisiana Territory because nobody knew it better than he did at that point. Um, so he's in St. Louis and then 
he Lewis killed himself like two years after this. Like he had like some mental issues or something. And what? Like, I didn't know that actually. Yeah, like I he I think it was like the stress or the pressure, or the fame. Like he'd gotten really famous and he got a bunch of money and like he he wanted to marry some girl and she rejected him and then like he shot himself like right like pretty soon after he got back and he was like not even 35 years old. So there's a lot of tragedy. Um yeah the lives of these men you know like if they if they didn't die from the environment they like faded into obscurity or were lost or like that uh james knight you know just being to abandoned like they didn't send a search party for two years and like no one and when they found him like they just kind of covered it up like they didn't want people to know that this guy had died trying to find you know you know dying for exploration um yeah. And, yeah. And also, like you just mentioned to the natural sciences like uh, I, I kind of noticed that thread when I first read about Prince Rupert and how, um, you know, they needed to, uh, England needed to uh, to raise funds to pay for like the Royal Society. Um, and it's just, it, it ties all the way through. A lot, a lot of the people who ran these companies and uh, charters, they were in it for the money. You know, they often, they took out dividends, they took their profits and invested it. Actually, the Hudson's Bay Company um put most of their profits and the dividends into pensions so that the board of directors wouldn't leave to start or join competitors so you wouldn't get your pay until you were like 70 years old uh just so that they would avoid you know jumping ship um in order to go somewhere else uh and share their knowledge but uh lewis and clark's expedition reminds me of uh someone from north um david thompson so he's uh, probably one of the more famous trappers. And well, I would say trappers, but really he was an explorer first. Uh, he joined the Hudson's hey, Bay Alan, Company. I'm, I'm actually yeah, go going to head out if, if that's okay. I'm going to sign off. Yeah, absolutely. Vandy, incredible, incredible knowledge. Uh, thanks for joining the uh, space tonight. We're definitely going to have yeah. you back again. Um, yeah. Yeah, really appreciate it. This was really fun. Let's do it again sometime. And uh, nice to meet you as well, Marlon. Take care. Of yeah, it was a pleasure as well, dude. I, I, I really, um, this is a topic that I have been passionate about for 15 years. Um, it's always been a reset for me to get out into the wilderness. And um, I, I think that more people should look into it to kind of reevaluate their lives and reset their lives and reappreciate what they have um, because. Um, <laughs> Things are not easy when you get out there, and um, yeah. you really realize that when you're trying to start a fire in in five degrees and you're dealing with frozen wood, uh, yeah. not store bought firewood. Yeah, but hey, it makes for a great story. Okay, sounds good, guys. I'll catch you later. Take care, Vandy. Talk soon. Uh, for everyone else listening, we're gonna jump back into David Thompson. Um, so he's kind of. Uh, maybe let's say the Lewis and Clark of the North. He joined the Hudson's Bay Company uh, in Fort Churchill, which is on the bay uh, in present day Manitoba. Uh, he joined as a clerk, uh, kind of like a bookish sort of guy, um, you know, didn't expect to be, you know, doing too much while he was out there. But despite the cold, despite the bugs, despite the danger and just really the, you know, kind of uh, placidness of it, uh, he really took to um, the sort of like mythic energy of the area. And at Fort Churchill, uh, he found the notes of its former governor, Samuel Hearn. So if you remember, Hearn is the one who found James Knight's uh, uh, surviving crew member, or sorry, not surviving, but- um, Not to interrupt you, but, uh, I'm, I'm very much a spurg on um, context. Everybody knows we're, we're dealing with uh, about 1770 when it comes to um, mm -hmm. time frame. For, uh, for Hearn, yeah? For Thompson. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Thompson. But um, yeah, but the reason I bring up Hearn was because uh, he was the former governor of uh, Fort Churchill. So we actually found a lot of his notes there. Hearn himself uh, in his lifetime, so this is before 1770, uh, went on several expeditions. Uh, he also tried to find the Northwest Passage, but he didn't really phrase it that way. Uh, he headed north, passed through the Chippewan territory up to where the Inuit are near the Arctic Circle. And as Vandy mentioned earlier, uh, he was actually the one who made it to the Arctic Circle and he carved his name into the rock. Um, 
to say uh, who he was, who he was there from, and uh, the date that he arrived. Um, and then he managed to make it back. On his way, he managed to uh, ascertain that there was no Northwest Passage, at least through the lower territories. That would come later once uh, ships were able to break through the ice. But we might get to, uh, to the Franklin expedition later on. But for now, Thompson, who had been reading through these notes, uh, took to it with a new passion. So he, he was very enthusiastic and he became skilled at valuing furs. Um, unfortunately, while he was at uh, Fort Churchill, he uh, suffered a fall and broke his leg. He spent two years recovering there. But in that time, he learned how to survey, he learned astronomy and mathematics. So this allowed him to become an expert cartographer or map maker. Um, now, once he had healed up uh, and he was ready to go back outside, he was very enthusiastic and excitedly approached uh, you know, the governor there and uh, the Hudson's Bay Company officials and said, you know, let me go out, let me survey the area, see what's out there, see who is out there. This would give us a better idea of the, um, what's going on. But if you remember, they were very anti-exploration. They didn't want people poking around and, you know, finding a great spot for a new town here and, uh, you know, new operation here. Uh, and especially since they didn't, you know, trust a lot of their own employees who could, at the end of their contracts, go work for someone else now with advanced knowledge of the area. So they turned him down and he was very frustrated. In fact, uh, because he couldn't take on this role, he decided to quit and join a competing company, the Northwest Company. Uh, kind of a, uh, a, a self-fulfilling prophecy there. So once he was there, he brought a lot of these skills, this knowledge uh, to the company, and he was made a full partner. And upon becoming this, uh, he told them, I'm going to go on a journey. I'm going to see what's out there. And so he started down the Columbia River, which goes, uh, I believe it starts uh, in Canada, but it goes through several states. Uh, and he was the first person to navigate the entire river. He would spend the rest of his life primarily uh, in the wilderness before he retired. Uh, and he's famous because he mapped over almost 2 million square miles of the continent between Canada and America today. And this was primarily through river travel as well. And this is with a broken leg that he healed himself in a shack for two years. Um, he was very dedicated and uh, he very much loved the country. He's referred to, as many people, as the greatest practical land geographer that the world has ever produced. But he's also famous for another reason. While he was traveling through the woodlands, valleys, and forests, he came across a lot of unusual sights, uh, and he took a lot of notes. You know, he described the animals, the birds, the bird calls, the different fauna and flora, and their tracks. And in fact, in 1811, in one of his journals, he recorded that he saw large footprints, 14 inches by eight inches near Jasper, Alberta today. So this is right by the Rocky Mountains. Many people believe that this is evidence, or uh, some of the first evidence of Sasquatch in North America. Now, David Thompson would later, uh, you know, rationalize this and said, I must have, you know, uh, maybe mismeasured or, you know, the, pr the prints, they could have been, you know, from a, a large bear. Uh, but not everyone thinks that, uh, that that was the case. But uh, there was a lot uh, to see out there, and there, it was fraught with danger. Um, exploration was obviously more perilous than just staying in the outpost, but some of them went and did it anyways. We talked about Lewis and Clark wanting to go and um, discover the area, you know, at the behest of their government, the people, you know, Lewis and Clark and Sacagawea, they wanted to go. They were drawn in by something. Uh, Osborne Russell as well. They were, he was pulled out, not because it was easy or that he could make a lot of money from it. He was putting his very life on the line to be an explorer, to go on this adventure. I think a lot of us have felt that pull before, but here they were actually going out to, uh, to find what the world would... Uh, what would have in store for them but uh if I, could, as, if I could jump in just uh yeah jump a, in marlon anecdotally um i mean this was i'm, I'm we're going back uh, probably 10 years uh from maybe a decade ago um i i've i've been trained um uh, nautically uh and i if anybody ever wants to 
learn about dead reckoning reckoning i know about dead reckoning when it comes to um finding your place with only a compass and the geography around you uh, but i went on a you know we, we will for, for the purpose of the space we'll call it an expedition it was like a four-day expedition um on a lake up in the northeast uh, but nowadays you have to go with um you have to go with the dec requirements and you know the we we went on a on a lake where they weren't there there were on hours and there were off hours and we were getting in during off hours uh where the dec agent was very much set set on no we don't allow people to navigate um at night and i just looked him in the eyes and he knew that i could very much navigate at night um because you're basically at, we had to we had to canoe four miles up and then um four miles around a peninsula and find a campground that was uh you know not the, the average man couldn't do um but we we used the stars um and we used pacing um that's a lot of dead reckoning is pacing um if you, if you know if you're traveling at three miles an hour or a mile and a half an hour depending on your weight um and landmarks um and we you know we were just we were laughing um it was just me and one other buddy uh we were, we were laughing at every star in the night was out and we're trying to navigate this lake um in a canoe and we're laughing how oh i'm sure our governor uh really appreciates this you know the the governors that uh care and look at i'm a, I'm, a, I'm a city folk as well but uh i i'm very in tune with the mountains and the, the waterways but our our current leadership have no idea um, what this kind of being in tune with nature is like. So we were just laughing because we're out here uh, basically dead reckoning to find our, our location for camp for the night. And it, you know, it's a, it's an eight mile journey of canoeing. Um, and, you know, we're, we're just laughing like we're, we're more capable of running the state than our, our own, our, our own governorship is. Yeah, sometimes they uh, they get blinded by, you know, their their experience. They forget that other people have done it as well. But um, this era of the Hudson's Bay Company, you know, we started with sort of uh, at this point, it's been explorers. You know, the first people to enter, you know, the the bay, the first people to meet with the Cree the first people to navigate the rivers, you know, now we're talking about them going, you know, from coast to coast. Um, there's a lot of different people who made expeditions at this time, especially as uh, other governments and settlements began to expand, they needed information and they would pay for it. So even though you're uh, the Hudson's Bay and other companies discouraged uh, explorers going out and charting this, uh, this area, there was a market for that information. So we hear tales of, uh, well, David Thompson and his travels through the rivers, uh, Mackenzie, who went uh, north as well, um, and uh, and eventually to the west and made it to the uh, Pacific. Uh, Frazier did as well. And these are men who traveled over mountaintops in order to, uh, to get there. Um, I mean, we have Hearn, we have Kelsey. There's no shortage of uh, adventurers that we can point to who made it um, as far as they did. But around the, the late uh, 19th uh, century, so the late 1800s, we start to see a change. Settlements have been popping up, and now the Hudson's Bay Company isn't just trading with the Cree or other uh, Indian nations. They're trading with settlers. And so they have to move further into the plains, and then settlement follows, and all the problems that come with it, the, uh, the Red River, settlement and the uh, the Métis, which we'll get into soon. Um, but uh, then they move into the mountains and they conquer the mountains and still more settlers are appearing soon. The continent is becoming crowded again and they don't need 
explorers. They need managers. And while there are a lot of, uh, you know, general or sorry, governors and factors who took over in the Hudson's Bay Company, and they made a lot of money, and some of them led interesting lives themselves. Uh, there's one that stands out, Donald Smith. So he managed to get an internship or uh, I guess at this point, an apprenticeship with the Hudson's Bay Company at 18 years old. And quickly, he rose to the ranks and became junior trader. Now, early on, he hated the isolation. Uh, in fact, he jumped ship at Montreal uh, in order to, uh, to get away from it all um, when he was uh, 22. But eventually, he, he found his way back. And he quickly put his mind to work. And uh, over the years, um, helped to rectify a lot of the issues that the Hudson's Bay Company was facing. Because they weren't getting as many pelts, and as Vandy mentioned before, they were losing their uh, Indian clientele as well, the people that they could trade with. Uh, the business was beginning to fail. It had had a golden era when they were the only ones as Caesars of the North, as Radisson had said, but that time was quickly escaping. The fur trade was declining and the newly formed uh, settlement of Canada was spreading West. So Donald Smith rising through the ranks and eventually becoming governor of the Hudson's Bay Company, um, interacted with many of the different settlements and the forming government uh, of British North America and later Canada. Uh, he himself was there at the Red River Settlement in Manitoba and met Louis Riel. Uh, this is a man who led a failed rebellion against the Canadian government on behalf of the Métis. While he was there, in fact, or after meeting Riel, Smith went to the government and urged them to form an expeditionary force to protect these outer settlements and Hudson's Bay Company forts that operated there. And this helped lead to the formation of the Northwest Mounted Police, which we know today as the Mounties. During his tenure, he sold a lot of the land that the Hudson's Bay Company had in his charter. He sold it to the Canadian government, to farmers and settlers, as well as the Canadian Railroad. And because of this, quickly became the richest man in Canada. He hosted diplomats, heads of states, uh, even the Pope once at his uh, house in Ottawa. Uh, and he was known throughout the world. Uh, once the Canadian Railroad was uh, built, he was soon knighted as Lord Strathcona, and he chose the beaver gnawing at a maple tree as his official crest. But he didn't just take a lot of this money to enrich himself. He invested a lot of the funds back into the company and expanded the trading posts into an early form of a department store. If you think about it, it's not that different from a trading post. If you walk into uh, an outlet, you'll notice that they might have a few of uh, on-brand items, you know, clothes or shoes, what have you. But oftentimes, stores nowadays will have other brands there as well. This isn't too far off from what the trading post would look like. You'd go in and you'd see different materials. And sure, most of them were owned by the Hudson's Bay Company. But they all came from different buyers and investors back in England. So the modern department store took its form uh, during this time. And Donald Smith was one of the, uh, the first people to sort of pioneer uh, this change in business. So as they expanded, they were more able to suit the needs of the uh, Canadian and sometimes American settlers that uh, they came across. Um, and with his money, he tried to, uh, to become a sort of philanthropist. In his life, he gave away over $12 million, which is massive if you think of the uh, the inflation that that would reach today and in his will he gave away 20 million dollars in his life he fully equipped a mounted regiment oh, wow, for the british in the south american war that boy, he had spent still years here? analyzing the boer war and Back the area to, to know that <laughs> mounted units would be the med victory med there man i'm sorry i don't know how to pronounce your name he uh he's he spent a lot of time uh helping those around him oh, here we go um but he never forgot that uh, the Hudson's Bay Company needed to be set up in order to succeed for the future. Uh, he was well loved by many Canadians. And there's this cool anecdote where he was traveling to, uh, to Halifax uh, from the West. And he stopped in, in a small town called Sudbury. Uh, and they presented uh, one of the, uh, the officers, oh, sorry, the troops from one of his, um, his units that he outfitted with a battle flag. And they stitched a, a saying on it. And all it said was, we are proud of the empire, we are proud of our queen, 
we are proud of Lord Strathcona. That regiment that went to South Africa fought for over a year. Not a better. I don't know. I'm still here. Colonizers selling blankets. Okay, sweet. I think it happened once. It happened one time. Could be wrong, but that was what I thought. Story. Is he Canadian? I don't know where he's from. I bet Metanagon fell asleep. Oh man, two people dropped out right now. That's all right. Snow Mexicans, friendly snow Mexicans. It's capitalism, it's a uh, homogenizing force. Sad. I guess if you consider Canada a nation. Great unknown.
who's talking right now? Oh, Marlon. Okay. Never was. Where you get Mattis people from in mix. Yeah, that sucks. It's wild, bro. That ain't right. Come home with syphilis. Can't be me. Indian strangers and the motherfucker. He never notices me. Thought he'd like me. Oh well, it's fine. Away she goes, boys. Oh, yeah, brother. Got to get somebody like that. Wow, that's rare. 
I've heard that it doesn't really work. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, gosh. Oh, man. Amazon is going to like TM Mars. That's kind of where we're headed. These giant companies did a lot of bad stuff, too. The incentives are screwed up. I've talked about it a little bit before, but that is something to be talked about. I don't know who that is. Prince Rupert, bro. Don't forget about Prince Rupert. Something's going on with the audio. That's, I think, the whole. <laughs> the adventure. Yeah. That is. Jimmy Buffett. Damn, bro. Yeah, it's not, fortunately. Love it. Like them all. Great man, very sweet. Rounds are Scipio Africanus.
Vi det er jo mor. That's okay, because you live that life. That's what's important. Yeah, well, conventional-ish, but, you know, I'm not doing that. Too much ground, man. Oops. Nerds, man, but I love it. Hell yeah. I'm going to follow these guys on Twitter. Uh, those of you who are still hanging out. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to end this stream here. If anyone's still here, it doesn't say it's maybe someone just joined, but I'm going to end this stream and uh, I might start one up in a little bit for something else. I might not. I'm not sure yet, but uh, yeah, thanks for joining me tonight. Appreciate it, fellas.